present Genius, Lady Reason's thick-witted reach-around. Here is your host, Dave Gorman. Hello, I'm Dave Gorman and welcome to Genius, the show all about your ideas. Every week, myself and a celebrity guest scrutinise a procession of ideas, hoping that amongst them we will locate the spark of true genius. These ideas are sent to us by you, the Radio 4 listeners. We receive emails that delight, amaze and intrigue us. And then we get emails like this one from a chap called Bob. Dear genius, I like taking photos. A few years ago, people used to finish a roll of film and then send it off to the chemists to have a print developed. Digital photography has changed all that, and now people's photos largely live in their computers and are rarely printed. My genius idea is for a camera that combines the instant thrill of digital photography, but also delivers a real print. (laughs) I think a camera should exist that prints off a photo almost immediately. (laughs) What do you think? Well, Bob... I think your email is fantastic. In fact, I think it's so fantastic that I'm going to take a photo of it. (laughs) Uh, While I wait for the Polaroid to dry, let me tell you that while Bob isn't here to discuss his instant printing camera idea, we have assembled a collection of people whose ideas don't already exist instead. And to discuss their ideas, we obviously require a guest of proven genius, and I'm pleased to say that we have just that. He's a writer, illustrator, producer and presenter. Ian Hislop once described him as the cleverest person he'd ever sat next to. Even more impressively, he's the only person I know to have written a TV review for an English newspaper that has led to him being investigated by the American Secret Service. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie Brooker. (laughs) Charlie, very nice to see you. Uh, Do you have any genius ideas? We know you're a genius. Anything you'd, you'd care to share with us this evening? This is just a practical thing, and this is something they could do tomorrow. Or now. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, clothes come with a, a size marking on them, you know, waist size, uh, XL, L, mm-hmm. S. Uh, just an age rating would be really handy on clothes. <laughs> just, um, if it just, if something said, you know, 22 years old to 29 years old, this is fine. <laughs> Beyond that point, you know, sad, lonely clown. <laughs> That would, that would save a lot of us well, a lot of embarrassment. My, my worry with that is that you'd have a shirt in a shop which says 25 to 35, and that some 45-year-old's going to look at that, and instead of thinking, that's advice telling me not to wear it, they're going to think, that's a magic potion. <laughs> What's going to happen tonight, Charlie? We're going to hear a few ideas. Uh, We'll find out which of them you deem to be genius. At the end of the show, the audience will choose from your two favourites and the winning idea will secure for its creator the much-sought-after genius trophy. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. The genius trophy, it says wonder. It says majesty. It says second in the 100 metres doggy paddle. (laughs) Now, let's start proceedings with our first potential genius who is Simon Spiro of South London. Dear genius, we are often warned of the dangers of driving while tired, but it is easy to ignore signs urging us to take a break as we are keen to hurry home to bed. Therefore, my idea is a motorway service station which moves at 70 miles an hour. (laughs) You may remember in the Italian job where the minis drive up a ramp into a bus. Well, my service station would resemble a large bus or car carrier with ramps at both ends. This could clearly be abused as a free bus service, so the catch is that every new car that comes on causes yours to be shunted forwards. If you don't finish your coffee in time, your car will be rolled off the front without you. This could save hundreds of lives on our roads. (laughs) Any initial thoughts, Charlie? (laughs) That's mainly a series of flaws. (laughs) together by some words, isn't it? Um, and, and the advantage of this is what? It's going to stop people falling asleep? On the... Well, I, I drive, yeah. and I get tired. Well done. But simu- oh. <laughs> simultaneously, I, I want to stop and take a break, but I want to get home because I'm tired. So if I could stop and get out and walk around and have a cup of tea, go to the loo, but while still moving at 70 miles an hour, that would be great. Right. <laughs> you know, two objects both travelling at 70 miles an hour, don't meet each other. Yes, well, you Unless see... they're going in opposite directions. <laughs> well, I thought of this, you see, because my, my original idea was to have them every si- going at 60 miles an hour in the slow lane, 
because then you'd, if you had them at every five miles, you'd catch up with one maybe every half an hour. But I realised they're going to be quite expensive, and that will be a lot of them. So you may as well just have the one that a few cars nearby can use. <laughs> What happens if the guy driving the service station wants a break? Well, then he, he takes it into the back of a huge... It's like babushka dolls right. of service stations. I like the idea of mobile services, but I'd say if you want a cup of coffee that badly, what's to stop a, a fleet of little mopeds? going up and down, like delivery guys that you phone, and they drive up alongside your car and pipe it into your mouth with a tube. <laughs> it's a good idea. A better but one? But you're calling mine dangerous, so... Uh, well, how is it more dangerous? <laughs> I, I will remind you, your idea involves cars being shunted off into the road yeah. without drivers. Yeah. <laughs> So a service station is going to have pretty big tyres to carry, so it'll just get crushed underneath the service station into a helpful recyclable flat pack. You're right, yours is safer. Sorry for doubting you. Though. What if there's a dog on the back seat? And that gets all crushed up thanks to you. Well, I'm a vet, so it would be more money for me as well. You've crushed a car into a handy recyclable mass with a dog in it, <laughs> and that's more work for a vet. <laughs> that's a big car-shaped coffin for a dog, is what that is. <laughs> um, you know, um, you mentioned the Italian job as your example of, of cars going yes. off into the back of another vehicle. Um, do you know how they got Michael Caine to actually do that? I think it involved they... a very heavily reinforced driver's cabin. No, it involved a stuntman. <laughs> <laughs> And that's my issue. This is statistically true. If you look at a British motorway, more people driving on that motorway are not stuntmen. <laughs> they are stuntmen. That is a statistical fact for you there, Simon Spiro. And that, I think, counts against this idea. I think it does need some very skilled stunt driving. <laughs> if, for some mad reason, they brought this in, we would become qualified stunt drivers as a nation, wouldn't we? And that's, a, that's an exportable skill. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I can see that. Oh, I don't know. It's, but it's, it's not my call. I don't know. I mean, the stuntman thing is tempting you, Charlie. I can feel that. I have doubts over the practicality of this suggestion. I'm afraid. I don't really think it's quite genius enough. Simon Spiro, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Let's see if our next idea can persuade you. It has travelled from Chertsey and comes from Phil Stocker. Dear genius, I would like to abolish the sound of the letter C. <laughs> it's a complete waste of time and space, and its job can be done more than adequately by the letters K or S. <laughs> this will make spelling a lot more simple. For example, the difference between Celtic and Celtic will become immediately obvious. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil. Um, uh, Charlie, don't go rushing to any... Uh conclusions at this point because we have another idea which I think we should consider at the same time as this one uh, and this idea comes from Neville Fuller who has travelled from Homefirth in Yorkshire. Dear genius, I am of the firm belief that the alphabet is too long. To my mind the letter K is of no significant use. <laughs> Give me an instance where K cannot be substituted with a C. Why not just remove the letter and let the C do the work on its own? <laughs> One of you is suggesting we get rid of the letter C and use the K instead, and the other one is proposing that we lose the K and keep the C. Obviously, it is not possible for you both to be geniuses. <laughs> Should one of you be a genius, it does mean that the other one is clearly an absolute idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it is also possible that you are both idiots, of course. <laughs> I don't know, Charlie, I mean, you've, you've got a C at the beginning of your name, you've got a K in the middle of your surname. This yeah. Would, this would actually affect you. It affects me. It doesn't affect me as badly as it would affect KC and the Sunshine Band. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to tell them? <laughs> yeah, because Charlie Brooker is my name. So under, I mean, what, am I Charlie Brucer or am I Carly Bro What? Who am I? Well, I know. <laughs> in this nightmare world you're planning. <laughs> 
to get rid of K, yeah. C is just pronounced K when a K would have been there in the first place. So you'd still be Charlie Booker, wouldn't you? C is in the middle of become and it's pronounced as a K. So you just replace the K with a sir and pronounce it as a K. <laughs> Perhaps the two of you should try and work out amongst yourselves which idea you think we should move forward with. I mean, well, one, of my, one of my major arguments is that it is often used as a superfluous letter, isn't it? K, knocker, knacker, knee. It's just it's pointless being there, isn't it? Where C, C is, uh, you know, you need a C. It's got two pronounced ways of saying it. Phil, Perhaps... how, do you, how do you answer that? <laughs> well... I've been sitting here thinking that, unfortunately, I'm not sure that Neville's really thought this through properly. <laughs> because my point is that I'm not going to get rid of the C. I just want to give it a different sound. Because as more and more words get added to the dictionary, sooner or later, we're going to run out of letters. So, therefore, we make lots of... <laughs> <laughs> I understood the beginning of the sentence <laughs> and I understood the end of the sentence I didn't understand how they connected to each other <laughs> as we come up with more words we're going to run out of letters you're thinking of numbers <laughs> <laughs> the point is in order to make up lots of new words for the new things we need to describe around the world we're going to need some different sounds and therefore I want to retain the C but give it a different sound what, what, what sound? Yes. Give us an example of this new sound. Oh. Use your mouth. That's good, that's good. I like it. Well, I get an exasperated that... sigh. I and I wish that... you hadn't asked me that kind of sigh. Uh, no, I make that noise every time I sit down on a sofa now. And previously I'd never been able to spell it. <laughs> And so now you're spelling it... With a C. <laughs> Just a C. Yeah. Every other word which has a C in it that we now invent, if it begins with a C, it starts with the sound that you make when you sit in a sofa. <laughs> we would need to get together to decide whether that was the best sound for it. <laughs> Because there are plenty of other sounds that we make, some of which are already in existence in the language, but don't have proper letters. For example, Llanethli in Wales is spelt with a double L, but clearly a double L isn't actually pronounced. <laughs> if you were going to pronounce Llanethli properly, it should be Llanethli. <laughs> different language. They're allowed to make things sound the way they want to. But they can't spell them properly. <laughs> I really like Phil's voice. It's sort of soothing. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite open university. I just, I feel like I'm learning stuff, even though I, even though I absolutely am not. <laughs> I like the fact that the alphabet is 26 letters long, and I think, if anything, we should introduce more letters. I, but I, I wouldn't suggest changing ones we've got. I disagree with both of you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it seems neither of you are geniuses, but you, I mean, you've argued, you've been at it, tooth and claw. Let's have a hug. <laughs> OK, let's see if we can restore some kind of sense of natural, rational order to the show with our next idea, which hails from James Woolley, and he is from Warrington. Dear genius, the 20s are the new teens, and with people waiting longer before settling down to serious relationships and careers, there is a definite market for a different kind of pet, something more grown up than a hamster, but that requires a similar commitment. Wouldn't it be brilliant to have a dog that will only live for two years? <laughs> A dog lover could have all the benefits of man's best friend without the nagging worry of what to do should your lifestyle suddenly, unexpectedly change. A two-year dog would have a full and rewarding life and, more importantly, a natural guilt-free death. <laughs> Charlie, are you, a, are you a pet man? Do you have a dog? You, this... No, I think animals are filth. Um, <laughs> I, I eat them. Um, <laughs> I quite like your thinking, though. Um, how do you know how long it's got to live? Has it got, like, a big 
LED display. <laughs> Preferably not within its eyesight, because it would just depress the poor <laughs> beast. Um, but a big countdown, like on 24, counting down to... It would just be bread. You could, over a period of time, right. develop a dog. I'm interested in how the animal dies. Does it burst? <laughs> Like a conventional dog, peacefully. Actually, not like a conventional dog, because often they get ill and have to be put down. So this would, you could have the benefits of just in its sleep. What, it bounds into the room and, and playfully plays dead and stays there. <laughs> yeah. Disappears in a puff of dog-smelling smoke. <laughs> there would be fewer uh, rescue dogs, but dogs home, you know. Greyhounds, look at those. I know you, you kind of explained this at the start, but what is the advantage? Correct me if I'm wrong, James. It's mm-hmm. that people's lives are more mobile, they move jobs more often, they have to relocate more often. You wait longer to start a career, to settle down, have a family. In your mid-twenties, you meet the woman of your dreams and she doesn't like dogs, and you think, well, give it a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you kind of came up with Logan's Run for Dogs. <laughs> I think maybe some means of putting the dog into suspended animation, like a pause button <laughs> for dogs. That's not a pun. <laughs> uh, oh, it is now. <laughs> it is a pun. I've realised it's a pun belatedly. No, but a, a pause button for so that if okay, so you move in with this new girl, or you know, this is your, your partner doesn't like dogs. You think, well, I can't kill it. I'll pause it until we inevitably break up. <laughs> um, wouldn't that be better? Well, I'm sure over time you could develop this. You could order however long a, a, a dog you want. You could have a week dog for a holiday. Or <laughs> if you're going away for the weekend, you want a guard dog. Or, you know, you could develop it. A guard dog for the weekend. So you yeah. come back. Your house is all right, but there's a dead dog. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to deal with a dead dog. <laughs> it's a depressing world, yours. <laughs> I, I think you're actually talking, Charlie, about killing dogs. <laughs> James is actually talking about breeding a dog which lives its natural life over the course of two years. He's not talking about killing them. It's, it's, do you own a dog? I do. How long have you had it? <laughs> uh, since February. <laughs> this technology doesn't exist, so I had to get quite an old dog. <laughs> Oh, it's not my decision. I have to throw it over to Charlie. I can see a glint in his eye, though. I quite like it. Um, I think it's clean, practical, ruthless, which is always a plus. Um, I think it's genius. There you go. Congratulations, James Woolley. You are, I say this to stop the letters arriving, an evil genius. <laughs> OK, well, our next idea, let's see if it can compete, comes from Manchester in the brain of Paul Kemp. Dear genius, sports are sometimes graded according to physical dimensions, hence heavyweight boxing and different size groups in weightlifting. Why then not basketball for people under six foot tall? <laughs> Very good, yes. I'm not sure if that's a credible sport or you just want to laugh at the spectacle. Um, <laughs> are they banned from playing basketball? No, but they just can't compete effectively. Right, I see. So you're talking about sort of bringing in a lot that there's a whole different league yes. for people under six foot. Yes. OK, and would you lower the hoops? Oh, yes. So Are they called look, hoops? It would look the same. Does basketball have rules of any sort? Because whenever I see it, it looks like a meeting that's gone wrong <laughs> with a ball in the room. Yeah. I mean, it's just colours and shapes bouncing around. I don't understand the rules of any sport. <laughs> basketball was invented at a YMCA when a priest nailed a fruit basket to the wall and then they all had a go at throwing this ball into the basket. I don't know how high he nailed it, but I'll bet he nailed it at a height that made it difficult. And what's happened to basketball now is a load of genetic freaks (laughs) play it and they're able to put the ball in the basket if they jump a little bit. But I, I went to watch a basketball game in Chicago and the score was 104 to 102. And that means a basket was scored about every 30 seconds. And it's not possible to be excited every 30 seconds. <laughs> well... And so you just get bored. <laughs> Sorry, for the duration of a basketball oh, game. Oh, OK. 
<laughs> and so I, I would like the basket to be higher, and I would, I would watch five footers playing basketball with the basket where it is at the moment. Yeah, but there's very few people who can play professional basketball these days. The average well, height is six foot six. Why not just allow stilts? <laughs> it, it would be slower. It would be more precarious. Yeah. <laughs> can you have basketball for people who are lying down? No, no. But you could have other sports like horse racing for people over 14 stone. <laughs> or shire horse racing. Yes. <laughs> I believe it would have to be. <laughs> There are professional basketball players who are five foot five and things like that. They do exist. Yes, very rare. Yeah, but aren't they good? Yeah. And don't they look funny next to all the yeah. other guys? <laughs> Sport is about who's best at something, and right now the tallest people are better at basketball. Yeah, but some sports have divisions, some sports don't have divisions. So either yeah. all do or all don't. Yeah, I think all don't. I'd like to see little people being punched by big people. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, what do you think? I'm anti-sport. I don't think it's genius. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) Never mind, Paul. Well, we come to the final idea for this show, and indeed, the very last show of this series. It comes from Zoe Falk, who in turn comes from Oxford. Dear genius, I think your voting system for the genius at the end of the programme is inherently unfair. (laughs) I believe that the audience warms up with clapping on the first contestant and tends to cheer and clap more for the second contestant. I think this is a serious scientific flaw in your programme. If I'm right and this bias does exist, I think it's essential that you bring in a fairer system. OK. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend I'm not upset. <laughs> Basically, you've got, you put two contestants up against each other at the end and you ask people to clap if they like the first contestant, and then you ask them to clap if they like the second contestant, the people who vote second know how much louder they need to shout to win. They've got that goal. You're really angry about it. I... <laughs> I've got news for you, though. We, we, we've looked into this. First I, series, we I had... did ask you to. Yeah, well, first series... <laughs> first series, five episodes. Second series, six... This is the final episode of the third series. Uh, so prior to this, uh, we have recorded 16 shows. OK. Which means on 16 occasions, we've put up Idea 1 against Idea 2. Right. And let me tell you, on only 12 of those... <laughs> <laughs> ..has the second Idea 1. <laughs> that is only 75%. OK. And I don't think anyone would be saying 75% is statistically significant. (laughs) People are going home labelled as a genius and they may not be a genius, and that could affect their life. I'm detecting detecting an air of bitterness. No, I'm concerned. You've let people out of this studio with that trophy and it could be unfair. They could be labelled as a genius. Yeah! (laughs) What sort of travesty have you invited me on to? Young lady, it is wrong that a man took home a trophy for suggesting that elephants should be genetically modified to be small enough to be house pets. <laughs> and that somehow that should have been beaten it's by a mobile a- phone with a built in breathalyzer. Well, you've got another thing coming. It's going to affect his life. He may have been chosen as a genius and he's not one. He'll get jobs that he's not, he's not up to the task. You know? oh, no. What are you proposing? Is done. Well, if it is something to do with the volume, so people he- know how loudly they have to shout if they really want to go for the second one, they should all... Um, they should block their ears. <laughs> <laughs> we could say, OK, everyone who's going to vote for idea two, could you leave the room <laughs> while we do this vote? You could do it with two different notes. So... If you want to vote for candidate one, you go, la. Candidate two, la. Oh, well, then the tone deaf are spoiling their papers. <laughs> this programme's broken. <laughs> I know, and, and 
we're stuck with the system as it is. We're not stuck tonight. We can, we can have a fair system tonight. <laughs> no, we can't. If, if you're the political party that wants proportional representation in Great Britain, you've got to win under the current system before you can implement it. <laughs> well, I, I think I'm too emotionally involved to even, to even suggest which way it should go. I, I'm just going to leave it to Charlie. Well, there's only one way to settle it, isn't there? <laughs> and that's to declare the idea genius and thereby... That's... that's inherently unfair. <laughs> <laughs> you can't but win! Yeah, but... You've just been called a genius. I, thank you. <laughs> We've heard every idea. Uh, the two ideas you, you said were genius are... Oh. <laughs> is clever, isn't it, that one? Yeah. Oh, the two-year dog. Yeah. yeah. And then you also said something about an improved genius voting system as well. So, uh, in which case, I'd like to invite Zoe Falk and uh, James Woolley to join me on the stage. OK, all those in favour of the two-year dog. And now all those in favour of the improved genius voting system. Yeah. I've got no choice whatsoever, Zoe. You didn't win. <laughs> um, the machine doesn't lie. <laughs> You're a genius. So there's just no way on earth I'm giving you a trophy. Thank you. It's as simple as that. No, 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 that's but thank fine. you for coming. We, we really you. do appreciate it. Thank you very much, Zoe Falk. James, it's an honour. When you first thought of the two year dog, was the main thing in your head, oh, that'll improve the world? Or were you thinking, that might win me a trophy? Um, trophy. <laughs> well, there you go. Your dreams come true. Ladies and gentlemen, James Woolley. We thank you, James, for gracing us with such a genius idea. I would like to thank Charlie Brooker for being a genius guest. <laughs> Everyone who fits their ideas, genius or not. And, of course, you for listening. But we just have time for a few suggestions from tonight's studio audience, which include that all celebrities whose surnames are also place names should be made to live in that place, <laughs> especially Leslie Grantham. <laughs> Driving socks... <laughs> And, ah, uh, that old chestnut. The world's oldest chestnut competition. Good night. <laughs>